those listening, welcome to the Design Leaders Podcast. Every day I speak with candidates looking to grow in the world of design, development and construction. I also speak with market leaders at the peak of their career who regularly talk about mentorship and helping the next crop of leaders in their development. How can we help professionals reach their goals in a small but ever-growing industry? Each episode, I want to provide a great opportunity for professionals of all levels to learn from a market and thought leader about avenues for development, areas to focus, how to speak about their project experience, and over time, help guide other professionals in their longer-term goals and motivations. Today, I'm here with Tatiana Gimeris, Healthcare Practice Lead of Gensler, Miami. I remember first seeing Tatiana's move to, from Perkins and Will to Gensler back in mid-2022. I'll allow her to speak about her own background in a moment, but for those of you that don't know Tatiana, Tatiana has spent her career in healthcare design and worked for some of the most notable and reputable firms in the world, including HKS, Perkins and Will, and now Gensler. Tatiana, I really appreciate you coming on this episode and welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here and hopefully inspire others to enter this profession as well. Awesome. I'd, I'd love for that to be the case. Um, but let's dive straight into it. I always start these episodes the same. So firstly, Tatiana, how and why did you get into architecture and design in the first place? Um, I, you know, since when I was young, and I would say preteen years, maybe a little bit younger, I would love to draw houses. I'll draw floor plans and houses. And then in my and we were like probably 12, 13, my parents built a country house. So it was my first time really more involved and looking at the plans and look at the construction. And I think since then, I really wanted to be involved in architecture. Um, and that's how this, you know, I remember choosing where to go and which universities and what to do. And whoever didn't have architecture as a background, I was like, not really what I want to do. There's nothing else in this list I want to do. So, so I think, you know, it was just, it happens naturally, it wasn't necessarily an influence from anybody, but, and here we are still 20 something years later. <laughs> well, 20 years later, you know, going from drawing houses and floor plans into healthcare design and architecture. So, you know, I, I guess the question being is, you know, how have you felt about spending your career in, in healthcare design and how did you get into healthcare design in the first place? Um, so first, I think my dad is a doctor. And I always loved medicine, but I never wanted to be a doctor. And it's a, I'm going to try to make the story short, but in many years ago, I won't say when, NBBJ was doing work in Latin America and having a lot of trouble entering Brazil. I'm from Brazil originally, by the way. I did my undergrad in Brazil. And they sent a letter to all universities or to major universities in Brazil recruiting an intern. And I applied and I applied thinking, oh, you know, next year I'm graduating from undergrad. I always wanted to live abroad. I'll reach them out. One day I got a call and I said, you are the intern selected. You need to be in Columbus, Ohio in two weeks. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm going to Columbus, Ohio. So I put a hold in my undergrad and I went to Columbus. And because the majority of the work they were pursuing was healthcare, I was placed in their healthcare studio. Mm -hmm. And then I immediately find my passion because there was that interest with medicine that I always wanted, that it was a perfect combination with architecture. So from there, I went back home, finished undergrad, and then went to Clemson University for my master's, who has a specific master's in healthcare architecture. So, and then, you know, that's history now, because that's what I've been doing for over 20 years. Um, and I think, you know, if you ask anybody who is in healthcare, there was something about being extremely rewarding we are you know we are helping other people and in general people are not in hospitals and, and granted today healthcare is so much more than just hospitals but still people are not in hospitals for happy moments except except if you're giving birth I think anything else you're not in your best state you're you're concerned you're stressed so I think that anything that we do if we think it can improve a little bit that experience in that moment in that person's life and that family and the people working with those those patients, um, it's really um, rewarding. I think it's, it makes it for everything we do. I think when, when I speak with candidates, uh, you know, often in this space of healthcare design, that fulfillment aspect, that rewarding nature of it often comes up. So for any junior professionals listening, I, I would really take note of, you know, how fulfilled individuals in healthcare design clearly are, with Tatiana being a really good example. Um, 
going all the way back, you know, whether that's Perkins and Will, HKS, Anshin and Allen, wherever it might be, how do you think your leadership would have described you in those early years of your career? You know, um, I think as, and that was actually sad and I'm, and I'm humbled to say this, but I think as a young star, somebody with a lot of potential, mm -hmm. and I think a lot has to do with really being very dedicated um, and very interested, right? I always wanted to learn, to see more, to do more. Um, I remember early on in my career, I wanted to, something was going on and I thought I had an idea. So I stay until midnight, you know, after hours resolving the problem because I thought there was something that maybe there was something there, right? But I had to do my job first. So I think those type of things, it's really what brought me here today. It's that type of interest and, and focus. I think it's clearly taking you in the right route now that you are, you know, the healthcare practice lead of the largest architecture firm in the world um, in that Miami office. So it's clearly taking you along the right route. And what about now, Tatiana? How do you think your colleagues, your peers, and, and your employees would describe you now as a leader? Very good question. Um, I hope, you know, because you never know the truth, right? People probably never tell us, but I hope they see, um, I like to mentor people, I really do. So I hope they see that I can be, you know, that I'm trying to teach them things and get them to the next level. I think the more people can learn and grow, the more we all grow together. Mm -hmm. So... I spend a lot of time talking and mentoring, and it can be mentoring about how you design the healthcare, it can be mentoring about how you relate with clients. So there's many different aspects of that mentorship is not so direct, and some are more formal and others more informal. But, um, and you know, and I've been, um, I been described as somebody who can be tough, but still is very, um, uh, I wouldn't say approachable, but, uh, but again, help people at the same time, right? Really trying to get others to be better. Mm -hmm. To be honest, when I think back to my leadership and, and who's been, you know, quite a, uh, quite impactful on me, it's that tough but fair and, and approachable nature, that combination of the two. So, I mean, it does sound like it works. Um, do you feel like there was a specific moment when you became a leader or, or did it happen over time? When did you look at your own career and realize, in fact, I am now a leader at this point? I think I was a leader much before I noticed, I realized actually. And I think a lot had to do with just taking ownership. Right? And I think through many moments, um, even very early on, I took, I took and I, I think two, one year out of school, I was doing a big project for Kaiser and suddenly I was just me alone with the client in meetings. And again, at that time, I don't think I was thinking I was a leader, but in reality I was. And it's because I was just taking ownership of the work I was doing, right? And and then I was lucky enough to have people surrounding me who let me take that ownership and run with it. Mm -hmm. I know with support, but just being able to be that person. And I think that's kind of a characteristic that if you look at happening all the time in many different factors, and a lot of times I didn't necessarily have the title of what I was doing, but I was already doing certain jobs. So um, that's probably, so it happens through time, wasn't specific, but I think it started really early on. And that's one thing that I think, you know, as we talk about the future of profession and young professionals is don't be afraid. I think people are, you know, it, take ownership, own your work, um, be due diligent about it. You have, you know, it cannot just be anything. You really have to be there. And but if you are committed, everybody sees it. Right. And people will give you more opportunities because of that. I couldn't agree more. I think it's kind of goes across different industries when the, the level of commitment is higher, the, the, the kind of the level of support and trust from the leadership will also come to. So totally makes sense. And I think it's, you know, useful for not just design professionals, but for everyone to take that sort of advice on board. What's something that you took on board from a leader in your past that you've continued to kind of, you know, keep in mind now in your career, something that you've taken from a leader in your past? I think was that I can fight every battle. You know, uh, I would wanted everything at the beginning and everything to be more and fight for everything. And at some point he told me, look, it's great, but you really have to choose your battles, right? 
because you can't find them all and you can't win them all. So choose the ones that really are important and focus on those. And I think that was a very good advice because as you go through life, things get more complex. You, you have more responsibilities and not everything is going to be able to be the way you want. And this goes for, for teammates, this goes for clients, this goes for many different relationships, but knowing the things that needs to be the right and fighting for those things, but not for every little thing, I think it's, um, it was a very good lesson. Interesting. Now, it, it, this next question might be a tough question, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of individuals out there that you can think of, and it, and it could be that individual, it could be someone else. But I'm going to ask you for just the one, but one quality former leader or mentor of yours that you respect and kind of keep a hold of that relationship until today, and why? Um, and I'll give you two because I can't just give you one. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was two. I think one was this leader that I just mentioned, which is Bill Rostenberg. Bill was probably the most amazing mentor I ever had. He was with me at Ashton and Allen. He taught me so much about planning, about really about being create flexible and innovative environments and pushing those boundaries from an operational, you know, medical planning aspect. If I could if I know a quarter of what, how much he knows, I would be so lucky in my life. Like the amount of knowledge was incredible and he gave me so much opportunities. Um, and also before him, I think this was right at the beginning of my career, Doug Olson, who now is at Stanford, um, was also an incredible mentor. And I think mostly because he saw something in me, saw opportunity, and he gave me opportunities, right? He gave me opportunities to go, to explore, to learn, um, even to make mistakes. And and that doesn't happen all the time, especially when you're very young. Mm -hmm. So having had that really, I think, um, allowed me to be where I am today. And, and I want to say one thing too, that is sometimes we focus so much on people right and who are our mentors in our careers and we have hopefully several through our paths but there is something about that we don't realize and I came to realize much recently is that as we work in different places actually sometimes you may not have a specific mentor but the environment may teach you something right I learned a lot of business at HKS I learned a lot about design in Parkinsonville I'm learning a lot about experience here at Gensler but it's not that I have a person necessarily sometimes you have a little bit more but but it's 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 the it's what you're hearing and connecting around you to. So there is that two piece that I think a lot of times we don't pay attention to that is also important. It's a different type of mentorship, but it's important to pay attention to your surroundings and what you can hear and learn just for being in certain places. It's an interesting note. I, I hadn't considered it. No, no one that I've spoken with on these episodes has, has kind of approached that environmental mentor as such, but it, you're right. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting note that. That's kind of a bit of an overview of your development and, and your growth until this point. We're going to move on now to more of a design-focused discussion um, before we move on to the other parts of the conversation as well. But if you could design or build anything absolutely anything money being no object what would you design what would you build Tatiana that's a tough question because I am in healthcare probably I would build healthcare of course well first of all I would build my house mm -hmm. and if I had no money no questions I would build my house but secondly I think um I would probably build a whole new healthcare system that really since money is not an object, really looked at a couple of things. I think look at where healthcare is going, right? How we're going from having very acute care hospitals to then more distributed ambulatory centers to more community hubs, potentially mobile hubs, and then down to the home, right? So how do you build that system and what those, and what does that look like when finances, and it's not just so much the capital to invest, but it's also the insurance, the paybacks, and et cetera, how all that would work, wouldn't matter. And, and then focus a lot on the experience that people are having in those buildings, right? Really spend time designing for, for them. For, and for them, mean patients and families, but also the staff and, uh, and being able to create, like, bring people from hospitality and design more with that focus. Um, think about um, you know, how can we improve efficiencies? So really apply all these principles that we talk and apply individually to projects in pieces, but bring in a much bigger option, much bigger approach, because money would not be any object. And usually it is, right? Cost mm -hmm. limitations. 
And being, and I think another layer to that is that we need to think of the future and the future we're leaving to our kids and families and everybody. So think about sustainability and resiliency and, you know, and, and how can we really do a carbon neutral building, you know, and really apply everything we learned to date into those buildings because it's so difficult to do that in healthcare. Or the demands that healthcare has is already almost impossible to do a carbon, a totally carbon neutral building. So it's how far can you take it if money is no object? I think that would be a really important um, piece to it. Well, I hope I see in the next five, 10 years, I hope I see maybe you've maybe spearheading Maybe I win the lottery, you know? <laughs> exactly, of course. Um, so that's kind of looking to the future, looking backwards, looking backwards. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of different projects over the last 20 plus years that you are proud of, but what's your favorite project that you've been a part of and, and what was your role on that project? So my favorite project is Palomar Medical Center. I still, and it's been over... 15, almost 20 years since we designed it, but I still love that project. It's in Escondido, California. It's a suburb of um, San Diego. It's a brand new, I think it was 400 bed hospital. I was the medical planner for the diagnostic and treatment. So emergency imaging, surgery, interventional platform area. And that was deemed a garden building. And so there was a lot of effort to really bring nature and natural light into the building. And if you look at the DNT, I think to this date, in the United States, you see that a lot in Europe, but you don't see here, there's gardens carved out through the building that mm -hmm. goes down to the DNT to bring more natural light and visuals and et cetera, because the DNT tends to be a very dark environment because it's a big footprint and they usually don't have a lot of natural light. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a very unique project from that perspective. And there's many other aspects I can talk, but, um, but that was, it's my favorite project to date. And still, it's a beautiful building. Interesting. See, before working in this space, I'd never understood the importance of green spaces in healthcare facilities. And after speaking with so many healthcare design and architecture professionals, the the passion, not just on your end as the designer, but the necessity on our end as the user, it, it, it's crucial. And it's only something I've learned about in the last few years or so. What's something in your career, Tatiana, that you are particularly proud of that you don't get to talk about all that much? I think the fact that I was the third female, I believe the youngest, president of DIA Academy of Architecture for Health nationally. And, um, you know, being able to be part of that association, which is a subset of DIA, but it's focused on the healthcare. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's an amazing group of people that I think we're really trying to make our profession as, as healthcare architects better. Mm -hmm. And how can we improve? How can we disseminate knowledge? How can we mentorship others? How can we support each other? And, you know, get to be president um, for it. It's really, um, you know, was, was something that I was always interested on. And it happened very early, you know, much earlier on than I think I would expect to. So um, I'm very proud of that. I have a feeling I might be mentioning this a few times during this conversation, but again, for any junior professionals out there interested in healthcare design, I'll, I'll remind at the end of this call, but we will include Tatiana's LinkedIn link um, to this podcast. Make sure you're connecting with Tatiana, because if you've got that interest in healthcare design, I can't imagine there's a better mentor to look at and, and, and connect with. What about now, Tatiana? What's something that you're, to the extent that you can discuss it, but what's something that your team is working on at the moment that you find particularly impressive and noteworthy? Um, we're working on a project that I can say to whom, but it's about consolidating their support services from clinical support services like lab and pharmacy to your, you know, general supports like supply chain, EVS, and et cetera. And it's very interesting from the perspective because it's um, we're talking about the future, right? Where is the future going? They have more than one facility. How can you support all of them? Is there ways to be more economical and efficient? So is this consolidated someplace of site? Is this going to be distributed through the sites? We're still in that conversation, but we're going to be bringing different, and this is really what I find exciting, different experts from different market sectors in our industry. So we're gonna bring somebody who has a lot of understanding about logistics and luggages in airports 
to the discussion. Um, another person who has been working with our Amazon team for a long time and can really talk about logistics, you know, transport and et cetera, but also about what Amazon is thinking about the feature, right? Is it drones? What is that feature of logistics in the world? And how can we prepare for that? And besides, of course, healthcare particular expertise is, for example, lab laboratories, but being able to have this very collaborative discussion about the feature, how you build for today, but prepare for, for later and bring different disciplines that is not your traditional ones that you're discussing to sort of broaden the discussion and be more provocative. It's very exciting. Interesting. Interesting. Now that does kind of cover the design section. We're going to move on to your upcoming goals for, you know, the future of your career. Um, but I guess kind of before we get there, looking at your original goals, what were your goals when you first started out? Have you achieved these goals and, and how have those goals changed over time, Tatiana? You know, I don't know if I ever had an exactly clear goal. You know, I, I knew I always wanted to do medical planning. So once I started my career, that was my focus. Um, I think when I started working with Bill, I remember when Bill was interviewing me, Bill Rustenberg at Anshin and Allen, he looked at me and said, what do you, you know, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to be you in the future. <laughs> I don't know if I got to be him. I think I got a different version of him and I took a slightly different path than he did. But um, but I I you know I I am growing to where I want to go. And I think there has been changes, like I've been doing more business development. I never thought that would be a path that I would take many years ago. Um, I love being around people. So I think that's why I love doing medical planning because of all the relationship with the users and the people that work in the hospital and business plan and business development kind of have that relationship with people as well. You're, you're out, you're networking, you're talking to clients. So um, that really, I think, attracts me. As I looked, you know, one of the things that attracted me to when I moved to Gensler is that I think I bought myself 20 more years of career, right? Because I'm regional leader for Florida, but, you know, I could be you know, regional leader for the whole Southeast, I could be global leader, I could be moved more into more of the overall health, not only healthcare. Um, there is, I could potentially become something more on the planning side. I think there's so many different opportunities mm -hmm. of how to grow. And uh, that is exciting because, you know, to have that sort of look ahead and say, oh, I still can do this and I can do that. And, um, and I don't know exactly my path to be very candid, like, where do I want to be? I don't know. I think I want to, do what I'm doing right now well, establish building a practice for a new office in Florida. Um, to build that is hard. Florida is a very conservative state. Uh, it demands if we are successful in this, then I think I'll be very clear of, you know, keep me going. But I think right now I'm very focused on this effort. I think, you know, listening to you there, you know, there's a clear goal for the future as well of where you, of what your position could become. Um, but apart from that, it's very important for junior professionals to not just see the positivity and the rainbows and, and, and see that there have been challenges along the way. What's something that you have not achieved or something that you would have wanted to achieve by now that you might not have done yet to this point? I think there's two things. I think to officially have the title I have today took longer. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for a little while now. I think that's an example. Like sometimes I think you do things, but necessarily doesn't mean you have the the official corporate titles for those things you're doing. Yeah. Um, and on another hand, I I love medical planning, and you know I would be very happy being like Bill Rostenberg was, which was basically like the the medical planner leader for a farm, right? I think that's something that I have not necessarily get there. Um, that I'll be, it could be a, it could be a future career path, as we say, but it could be something that um, would be interested because I love doing this and 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 I love doing it because I love the challenge of it and and to try to push the boundaries of this, right? Look at innovation, look at ten years now, because when we build healthcare, we're building buildings that are going to be here for fifty years. The technology, in medicine, the procedural, you know, aspects of medicine evolve so fast. Now, if you look 50 years ago, look at what an MRI looks like, look at what a surgery room looks like, it was so different. The protocols, the, what we could do, um, we can't predict 50 years from now. 
So how do you design for that? And how do you create enough flexibility in the space? Um, and at the same time, as you're thinking about efficiencies and flexibility, you're, you need to think about people, right? And how can you make those places more humane and more, um, you know, to create better experiences? So it's a nice balance. And, and, and you can get so drilled down into the little things and how everything gets located and not look at this big picture to be better. And I think that's sort of when I think about an aspirational position of planning using that is like, do a bigger picture. Are we achieving these other bigger goals first before we're relocating the right soil utility position, right? So it's, um, so who knows? Maybe one day, maybe never. <laughs> maybe one day. Well, I, I imagine with the trajectory that you've taken so far, I imagine if, you know, if you're putting your mind towards it, you'll achieve it at some point. Um, Okay, great. So that's your goals, um, upcoming goals as well. Now moving on to some advice for industry professionals. As a leader in this space, I'm sure you look at a lot of resumes and a lot of resumes of junior to more senior candidates. When looking at a resume, what's some things that you want to see from a top quality candidate? I think it's a mix, right? I think uh, it depends also on where you are in your career. If you're mm -hmm. looking at a, first of all, in architecture portfolio is important. So we want to look at people's portfolio. I think you sell to your portfolio. And I think it is particularly important to understand for younger professionals, right? When you graduate, the most important thing you have is the work you did in school. So really understanding that when you are in school, that what you're doing in the studio is really what's going to get you higher later. It's important. Um, so that is the first path. We all look at portfolios more than we look at actual list of resumes. Mm -hmm. Then we do look at your resume to understand what type of projects we work. And the challenge with both is that make sure you describe what was your role there, right? What exactly did you do? So we can really, because you, you know, I may show, for example, I may show a beautiful building, but I didn't design the exterior of the building. I did the planning, right? Mm -hmm. um, but showing a floor plan, maybe not as interest. You may want to see some images and things. So, but so be able to describe what was exactly your role role I think is very it's very important um second so I think those two things because that's where it's going to get you to the door right if you have a nice portfolio you worked in interesting projects and then you look at your resume you know where um more than where did you go to school maybe that's when you come out it's less important but I think it's you know if you had experience where what was your experience what was the projects you work on and particularly for me in healthcare I'm of course looking more for healthcare related you know projects that it can be easier for, to, to bring you into a team i couldn't agree more about your you know the, with the portfolio your role on that portfolio you know as as a recruiter in this space when i send over a profile to a client one of the first things they're always asking is for the portfolio their role on the portfolio the different design phases that they've touched and so on so i, I couldn't agree more what about the interview, Tatiana? What are some mistakes that you've seen candidates make in an interview that will help benefit their experience moving forward? You know, I think more than mistakes, the big thing, and this is, you know, I'm looking for somebody that is more, it's driven. They want to, they're interested in coming to work with you. They're interested as you, when you are, you're doing that you're driven. You want to learn more, right? You want to grow, you want to learn. I think um, the biggest mistakes tend to be people who think they know more than they really do. Mm -hmm. And this can go off of somebody fresh out of school who thinks they're going to be designing a whole building <laughs> the next day. And as it can be for somebody who may have been in, a, in the career for a longer time, but didn't have the same opportunities. So may not have learned as much as others could have, but just because it has X amount of years, think they know more. So I think that's the challenge is how you balance that. Mm -hmm. But but I think we can train people. I think we can mentor people. I think people can grow. So having the interest is probably, to me, the most important aspect when I'm hiring somebody. Wanting to learn. Yeah. Wanting to work, driven, the interest. I, I like it. It's, it's, again, kind of across industries, it's something that we'd look at as well, and I'm sure other industries would look to. How do you, I, I've got two part question here, one that's kind of more short term to the immediate future and one that's kind of far, you know, far, far longer term in the future. But how do you think the industry is going to change, let's say, initially over the next kind of three to five, maybe five to 10 years whilst you're a leader in this space? I don't know. I think that we won't see 
in the short term, I don't think we'll see big changes, right? I think we are definitely using more and more software. I think everybody has to be nimble and it's not just Revit. There is, I don't know, the number of different softwares we use with Revit, outside of Revit for simulation, for uh, to test lighting to many different aspects. I think we're gonna see more and more of that. I think mm -hmm. that's a constant evolution. So Revit's like a bare minimum baseline that people need to know today. Um, and I think that's where we continue to grow, probably in the short term. Now, I'm guessing your next question is the long term. The long term, it's it's interesting, right? Because we are AI is here. We have ChatGDP now. You know, we are we can write. I haven't used it yet. I'd be very curious to see could I write a proposal out of that and see what happens. You know, so like, um, how will AI really change the way we're working? There was recently just an example of a whole architectural project done by AI. I think was a house. Um, so how much of that is going to impact the feature of the profession? And if you have computers doing a lot of that for you, um, if what will be um, our role, right? And how our role will change? I think we still need us. I think there is always going to need to be that more aspect of the connection and understanding of people. So how is that going to change the way we work today? I think that's probably for the next generation to experience. Interesting. I feel like chat GPT is, is changing every industry. I do want to make note that after my first podcast episode, I asked chat GPT to create me a script of a podcast episode around architecture and design. And I don't think the script was as good as my original script. So I think it's got good. some work. It's got, it's got some work to do there. Um, yeah. Tatiana, if anyone wants to learn more about the, the the Gensler Miami practice, particularly in healthcare, what can they do? Can they, can they reach out to you? Can they look online? What, what can they do to learn more? I think they can definitely reach out to me. As you said, you share my contact. Um, we also, we have a very robust website. I think if you want to know more about the firm, you know, googlegensler.com. There is a lot of research, we do a lot of research. So there is very interesting articles written in all sorts of different practice areas, including healthcare. Um, and you know, I think even if you are not interested in working for Gensler, I think it's a great resource yeah. for anybody. And, um, and it also shows a little bit about the portfolio and what we're doing as a firm in healthcare, but particularly to Miami, they can definitely reach out to me. And I am recruiting, by the way, I am looking for a project architect in healthcare. So you see, so maybe this will get me one. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm connected with a lot of them. This will be shared with a vast number of healthcare architects. So you've heard it here, um, guys on the, who, who are listening. Tatiana is looking for a project architect with that healthcare background. Now, Tatiana, and we've, we've now spoken a couple of times. And one thing that has come up on a couple of occasions, um, given that you're from Brazil, given that I'm from England, the, arguably the two homes of football or, or soccer, as, as many Americans would say. So off topic from architecture and design. I mean, one thing I'm just generally interested in is is, is favorite team, favorite footballer and your um, guess for who's winning the next World Cup, although I think I have an idea of who you might think it is. Oh, my guess. Uh, so favorite team, I think first is probably my home team, Internacional, mm -hmm. in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Um, you know, it is my heart is to them. So even though they have their ups and downs, always going to be my favorite team. Um, and of course, the Brazilian national team, you know, I I don't miss one World Cup. I don't miss one game. I am a huge fan, as any Brazilian can be, and you can mm -hmm. totally relate to me. Um, so that, in regards to our best player, uh, probably I, you know, it's I don't know if he was the best player, but I think it's the one that I rec I remember with most um, a praise is actually a duo was Romario and Bebeto. You know, we won two World Cups with them and they were incredible. You do have both Ronaldos, you know, Ronaldinho Gaúcho and the other Ronaldo, and they're amazing players if you look to their careers and what they've done. But I think as, as um, a fan of our national team, these two really contributed to the team and made us win two cups. So, um, so my vote goes for them. And, you know, I always cheer for Brazil and I always hope we can do it. We have amazing players we're playing worldwide. We should be able to win every World Cup. It hasn't happened in a long time. So I'm always hoping for the next year. So I'll vote for them. I don't know if it will be them. I just keep my hopes up. 
Well, listen, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I've, I've never seen England win a World Cup. So I think it, it's back in 1966. So I'm also hoping next time, next time. Um, so, yeah, guys, I, I said it earlier in the uh, in the episode for any junior professional or, you know, even senior professional intermediate connecting with Tatiana would be you know a real benefit to you. Follow her on LinkedIn. Have a look at the Gensler website. But with this episode, we will be sharing Tatiana's LinkedIn profile. So I will I would encourage anyone listening who's interested in design and architecture, but particularly in healthcare to go ahead and connect with Tatiana because I can only imagine there's not many more better mentors out there and there's still a long runway left as well. But Tatiana, you know, I've asked you all the questions. Is there anything about Gensler, about your role, about your career that you feel that we've not touched on that you think would be important for those listening to know? I think more than anything is that um, we're building something, right? And hopefully we'll be building something unique. And I think for people who are looking into the healthcare profession is a lot of people steer away from it because there's so much uh, limitations and obstacles from a design perspective, right? You, I, when you design a museum, you, you can do whatever shape, form, whatever you want. Here is so driven by functionality. But I think that's the challenge and that's the passion on it. You know, it's that you can really make something unique and beautiful as long as you understand what is going on inside and really work for that. So that that merge, that bridge is so important and it's so um, inspiring, inspiring to others that I really hope more people look at healthcare with, a, with more interest and more love than usually they do, um, especially from, you know, strong designers in architecture who tends to, you know, don't think it's as interesting again because it is more limited, milita- limited in what you can do. And for anybody interested in learning more about healthcare architecture, I think the AIA Academy of Architecture website is also a great resource. There is links, there is conferences that happen yearly, there is um, articles published, but also links to other, other institutions that can provide information and lots of great people to connect with all over the country. So it's a really great resource. And they do webinars throughout the throughout the year. So um, it's a great resource to also get more information on it. Awesome. Well, when I inevitably share this episode all over LinkedIn, I, I'll look to include, as I said, your profile on LinkedIn, but also possibly that link too, so that anyone has an, you know, an easy access there. Tatiana, honestly, you know, I couldn't thank you enough to come on this podcast. I think it'll be really, really valuable to those listening. um, And I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it was really nice. Hopefully more people will come and join us in healthcare. We hope so.